at this time, at this time I would like to invite Lieutenant Colonel Russ McKelvey, commander of the 1st of the 157th Infantry Mountain, and Mr. Jack Adler, Holocaust survivor of the Auschwitz and Dachau concentration camps, to come forward. Jack Adler is a Holocaust survivor who works with the Meisel Museum to share his unforgettable story with audiences, especially school children across our state. Jack speaks for those who have been silenced, which includes members of his own family, and in doing so imparts valuable lessons connecting, connecting the past, past to the present, present inspiring others to stand up to racism and bigotry in our communities. Jack survived the Auschwitz and Dachau concentration camps, and many of you know that the Colorado National Guard's 157th Infantry Regiment, along with Oklahoma's 45th Infantry Division, were responsibili responsible for the liberation of Dachau in 1945. By that point of their arrival at the camp, Jack no longer was at the camp. He was on a death march and was liberated by Patton's third during that march. And he'll share that story with you here momentarily. After liberation, Jack moved to the U.S. as a war orphan, went on to build a life here, serving in the U.S. Army, marrying and having children, grandchildren, and a great-grandchild that he hasn't been able to hug yet, but oh, he wants to. We are proud of the special relationship we're building with the Meisel Museum and tremendously grateful for Jack's attendance here today. Before he speaks, though, at this time, I would like to invite Lieutenant Colonel Russ McKelvey to come forward and share a bit of the history of the 157th in World War II to give us a bit of perspective. Thank you, Rick. Uh, good morning. Um, as Rick just told us, one of the things that we're going to do today is to raise the flag of the Colorado's 157th Infantry Regiment, a 45th Infantry Division Thunderbirds, uh, who fought in World War II to the Colorado Freedom Memorial here. Myself, uh, some of the soldiers of the 157th Infantry here, and the 3rd of the 157th Field Artillery back there with the, Howl uh, the Howitzer, are here to represent those Colorado Thunderbirds that left to fight for freedom and did not return. A little about their story. In 1942, in response to a nationwide effort to halt the expansion of German and Japanese initiatives of world domination, Colorado National Guard's 157th Infantry Regiment was mobilized and attached to the 45th Infantry Division. The unit had in its past stopped the Confederate invasion, Confederate invasion into New Mexico during the U.S. Civil War, taken the city of Manila during the Spanish-American War, and fought valiantly during World War I. Together, with other 45th Infantry Division units from Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, the 157th would spend over 500 days of combat fighting their way through Italy, France, and Germany to finally hold Munich. Colorado's 157th Infantry sailed for North Africa in the summer of 1943. After they received Patton's brief, they performed one of the first amphibious assaults of the war uh, in Sicily. Over a month later, on August 18, 1940, uh, 1943, the island of Sicily was liberated and used as an Allied stronghold and while the unit sailed on to Italy. The soldiers had covered 130 miles over eight days. Two weeks later, the 157th set out to amphibiously attack Salerno, Italy, where Hitler's supporters put up a fierce defense and follow-on counterattack. A week later, they held the city, and it was time to continue the pursuit of the German army. Their initial momentum in Salerno gave way to stiff resistance and brutal combat and was followed by five months of sustained, intense combat and frigid weather in the mountains along the winter line. In January of 1944, the 157th made a third amphibious assault, this time to take the city of Anzio, where they fought three major battles over the course of six days in order to maintain the beachhead, followed by four months of some of the most brutal combat in World War II before breaking through. The 157th sustained over 1,000 casualties killed or wounded in the month-long fighting for that city. After four months of holding that position at Anzio, the soldiers of the 157th then headed for Rome. It took them the entire summer of very hard fighting against German artillery, sniper fire, heavy armor, and infantry. But in June of 1944, the unit finally took Rome. 
Then they conducted their fourth and final amphibious assault on the beaches of southern France and began fighting through three months of unrelenting German resistance in the Vosges Mountains before finally crossing the Rhine into Germany. During the winter of 1945, they continued to fa face uh, intense German resistance. They fought on, defeated the Germans after 12 days of intense urban combat at Aschaffenburg. After 500 days in combat, the soldiers and the feeling among the soldiers was that finally the worst was over. They could soon start the process of celebrating victory, going home, healing their physically and emotionally overused bodies, and mourning their loved ones, their lost loved ones. This was not the case. On April 29th and 30th, 1945, the 157th Infantry witnessed the ultimate atrocities of evil and liberated one of the most notorious concentration camps in Europe, Dachau, saving over 32,000 lives. They came as soldiers, they left as liberators. In the darkest moments, we witnessed true compassion, courage, and extraordinary heroism from these soldiers. They reminded us that humanity can and will prevail. The 157th Regiment truly embodied its motto, remember the mission. In its 660 days overseas, they were in battle for 511 days. They were reconstituted two and a half times. Soldiers of the regiment were awarded four medals of honor, 20 Distinguished Service Crosses, 376 Silver Stars, 1,054 Bronze Stars, and 1,694 Purple Hearts. Their service and sacrifice gave millions life and the opportunity to pursue liberty free from the grasp of tyranny. As General, John, Ar General of the Armies John Pershing once said, time will not dim the glory of their deeds. The flag we will raise today with the help of Mr. Adler serves to commemorate their bravery in the face of evil, to preserve and protect the values shared amongst all mankind. I'll end with this thought, their motto, remember the mission. They gave all to make the world a better place. I hope all of us can honor that mission by living with the same intention, remember the mission. And it's now my great honor to introduce our honored guest, Mr. Jack Adler. As Rick told us, Jack was a young man and teenager during World War II, and he was one of the Holocaust survivors liberated from the camp at Dachau by American soldiers in 1945. Thank you. I'm honored by your invitation. I speak to you as a child survivor of the Holocaust who spent age 10 to 16 in the Holocaust. The first week of September 1939, the Nazi armies occupied my hometown in Poland where I was born, the city Pabianice, Poland. The population my hometown at the time numbered around 42,000. The Jewish population, almost 9,000. Almost immediately after the occupation took place, the Jewish population was notified by the Nazi armies that in order for us to leave our homes, we have to wear two yellow stars of David attached to our clothing, one in the front, one in the back. In February of 1940, we were moved into a ghetto in the city of Pavianice. The ghetto was an open ghetto, meaning there was no barbed wire surrounding it. However, we could only move within the ghetto during daylight hours. We remained in the ghetto of Pavianice, working outside of the ghetto on different projects the Nazis provided. May 16, 1942, the ghetto of Pabianice was being liquidated, and we were told to be in front of our dwellings at 2 p.m. sharp. 2 p.m. sharp, dozens of Nazi officers and soldiers arrived and marched us all to the soccer field. When we arrived to the soccer field, it was divided right down the middle. <coughs> They divided us into two groups, A and B. Group A were told to move to the left, group B to the right. Only then did we realize why we were divided into those two groups. In group A, you found those the Nazis viewed as 
useless eaters, the old, the sick, the young. My little sister was in group A. My father, older sister, and I were in group B. My mother and older brother died in the ghetto of Fabianica. We stayed in the soccer field all through the night. Around 10 o'clock or so, a couple of Nazi soldiers marched up towards Group BS for volunteers to pick up the debris that was left behind by those who were being shipped out from Group A, like articles of clothing, pieces of paper. Hoping to see my little sister again, I volunteered. Each volunteer was giving a baby carriage. In those days, they had those deep baby carriages. And I slowly moved from group B towards group A, bending down, picking up pieces of paper, articles of clothing, not to attract any attention. And when I got close enough towards group A, and it was dark in the soccer field, most of the lighting came from the headlights, from the trucks that surrounded the soccer field. And when there were no Nazis moving around, I started calling my little sister's name out. And some of the people who were still in Group A repeated calling her name. And she came running towards me, frightened, crying. And I motioned to her to wait, make sure no, one is, no Nazis are looking, and try to get into the baby carriage. And she did so. And I slowly moved from group A towards group B where my father and older sister were waiting to hear from me. Once again, bending down, picking up pieces of paper, articles of clothing. However, this time to cover her up because if the Nazis would have realized what we were up to, they would kill us on the spot. And when I got close enough towards group B and I told my father and sister she's in the baby carriage and they took her out. The following day, we found out what happened to those who were in group A, the old, the sick, the young. All of them perished in the extermination camp at Helmno, Poland. Group E were moved to the ghetto of Lodz, L-O-D-Z, in Poland. The ghetto of Lodz was a huge ghetto because they sent the Jewish people from small towns into the ghetto of Lodz. I would say in its peak, the population in the ghetto of Lodz exceeded 300,000. The ghetto of Lodz was surrounded by barbed wire. Every 10, 12 feet, there was an armed Nazi guard station to make sure no one escapes. Occasionally, people tried to escape, and they were killed on the spot. In the ghetto of Lodz, the Nazi established all kinds of factories to assist them with the war machinery. I was assigned to work in a straw factory. We were ordered to manufacture straw shoes to be worn by the German soldiers who were then fighting the Soviet Union on the Eastern Front to keep their feet warm. We remained in the ghetto of Lodz until late summer 1944 when we were ordered to report to the railroad station. Once we arrived to the railroad station, we were herded into boxcar, cattle cars, packed like sardines into a cans. We traveled to an unknown destination for about two days. And when we finally arrived to that unknown destination and the doors opened to the boxcar, we were greeted by Nazi officers, soldiers with whips and dogs shouting at us to disembark at once. Men separate from women line up five across and march forward. We were also greeted by prisoners whose job was to take away whatever meager belongings one brought along with them. And they whispered to us, when you march forward for the selection process, look strong if you want to live. You just arrived at the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination and selection camp. We marched forward for the selection process, which was being conducted by Dr. Joseph Mengele and his henchmen. When you approached them, they looked you over. If in their eyes you looked strong enough to be able to perform some slave labor for them, you were moved to one side. And once again, the old, the sick, the young, including my little sister, whom I say for about two years, were ordered to move to the other side. Those who were ordered to move to the other side were marched straight to the guest chambers. My father and I remained in Auschwitz-Birkenau 
for about a week. Every day we had to go through a selection process. Finally, we were sent to the concentration camp at Kaufering, Germany. Kaufering, Germany, the camp was under the jurisdiction of Dachau. My father and I were assigned to work at the construction site where the Nazis were building underground hangars for airplanes. The two of us were assigned to carry bags of cement as the cement arrived by rail from the rail station to the actual construction site back and forth 12 hours a day. Around March of 1945, I was separated from my father and sent to the main camp of Dachau, Germany. The population in the Dachau camp, I would say over 90% was non-Jewish. You could find every European nationality in the Dachau camp. Each group of about 25 prisoners had a couple assigned to them, K-A-P-O. A couple was like a foreman. It was his job to make sure whatever assignment was given to his group of prisoners is being performed properly. The head of our camp and of all the guards was an SS colonel. One day he called my couple in and ordered them to send him a young prisoner to keep his office clean. Being the youngest one in the group, he picked me for the job, which was much easier. All I had to do is sweep the floor in his office, dust the furniture. It was getting cold. By then he had a wood burning stove. I had to make sure the fire keeps going. Daily, the first thing I would do as I walked into his office, sit down on the floor, empty out the ashes from the wood-burning stove. And almost on a daily basis, within the ashes, I would find neatly wrapped in pieces of wax paper, pieces of bread, pieces of bacon, the colonel would throw in for me to find, or else he would have thrown it into the garbage. The first part of April 1945, the Nazis allowed the International Red Cross to enter Dachau to distribute food packages to the non-Jewish prisoners. However, they had some leftover and they decided to distribute those to young Jewish prisoners. I received one of those food packages, like a care package, which I immediately opened up, took all of its contents out, put it across my belt line so no one would take anything away from me. Mind you, first part of April, even the German people in 1945 had many food shortages. Sugar was one of them. And this package contained a bag of sugar. So as we marched back to camp after work, one of the Nazi guards approached me and asked me, did you receive a food package today? I said, yes, sir. He asked me, do you still have the bag of sugar? I said, yes, I do. When I told him I still had the bag of sugar, he took out a slice of bread from his duffel bag and showed it to me and said, if you give me the sugar, every day you get a slice of bread like this. The slice of bread to me looked like life. I gladly turned the sugar over to him. So the following day, marching back to work, I made sure I'm on the outside where he was guarding us so he could see me and give me a slice of bread as promised. As he passed me by after a while, he looked at me, I looked at him, and he says to me in German, Was Mr. Haben, what do you want? At first I thought maybe he didn't recognize me. I told him I'm the one who gave you the bag of sugar. You promised me a slice of bread every day. And when I told him this, he took the rifle off his shoulder with the rifle butt, hit me in my rib cage, and said, here's your bread. I barely made it to the commanding officer's office. And as I stated, the first thing I would do is sit on the floor, empty out the ashes from the wood-burning stove. And after I completed doing so, I was in so much pain, I was unable to get up, and I started to cry. And mind you, he was a higher-ranking Nazi officer, an SS colonel. He came up to me, and this was the first time in over five years, especially a Nazi officer would talk to me like to a human being. He said to me, was is los, meine Junge? What's wrong, my boy? Even though I realized the consequences may be very harsh to inform on a Nazi guard to his superior officer by a Jewish boy, I was in so much pain, I didn't care what he does to me, and I told him what happened. And he, in turn, said to me, tonight when we fall in, before we march back to camp, we had to fall in to be counted. He ordered 
me to point the guard out to him. Reluctantly, I did so. So marching back to camp, I hid in the middle of the group of 500 that was marching back to camp, hoping the guard wouldn't see me. Nothing happened. The following day, same thing. I'm in the middle of a group of 500 going back to work. And after marching for a while, I could see out of the corner of my eye, this guard is pacing, looking across each row of prisoners. I said to myself, here comes another beating, or he could kill me. But to my surprise, as he saw me, he reached out and handed me a slice of bread. I couldn't believe it. And when I came into the commanding officer's office, practically the moment I opened the door, he approached me and asked me, did the guard give you any bread today? I said, yes, sir. He says, every day he's to give you a slice of bread, as he promised. If he fails to do so even one day, let me know and I will deal with him. Even though he was a high-ranking Nazi officer, but he knew the war was coming to an end. He was a decent human being, as I'm sure there were many other Germans who got caught up in the Nazi movement, not knowing what they got into, and he saved my life. We remained in Dachau until April 25th of 6th, 1945, when 7,000, almost 7,000 of us, were marched out of Dachau. The march has been documented as the Death March. We marched all during daylight hours. At night, they would say a group to the other side of the woods, and they were killed. When we were liberated early in the morning, May 1, 1945, by the United States Third Army under the command of General Dwight David Eisenhower and George Patton, there were less than 4,000 of us left. I was very weak. I wouldn't have made it one more day marching. And those who couldn't continue the march, they wouldn't leave behind the life. They would kill him. I was immediately hospitalized in a newly formed displaced persons camp in, Chicago, in Germany, in Fierenwald, Germany. I remained in the displaced persons camp until December 1946 when the Jewish Children's Bureau brought me to the United States. I was 17 years old, and I was placed in a wonderful foster home in Chicago, Illinois. First, I attended night school to learn the language. I furnished high school, college. I proudly served in the United States Army. During the Korean conflict, I got married. I have two wonderful children, four grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. The Holocaust ended 70 some years ago. What has humanity learned from the evil we call the Holocaust? Not much. There is more anti-Semitism going on today than almost in the days when Hitler rose to power. You know, we don't have to love everyone. I don't. But we should respect everyone. Mutual respect guided by the golden rule do unto others as you like them to do unto you is the key to the survival of humanity. Until humanity will allow itself to be guided by the golden rule, we will continue to destroy each other. I wish you all the very best. And I'd like to thank some of the GIs who may still be here who liberated me. One more day I wouldn't have been here came just in time. Thank you very much, and God bless America. Mr. Adler has now been joined by current members of the first of the 157th who will assist in the raising for permanent display the World War II flag of the 157th. The Colorado State Bagpiper, First Sergeant Jim DeGeorge, accompanying them now, saluting the 157th. It'll be followed by the firing of one round by the 3rd Battalion, 157th Field Artillery Brigade. 